What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Rock Your Brand podcast. Today, we are going to be talking about, well, a formula that I believe, that Chris believes, is going to work in 2024 when selling on Etsy. Now, I kind of got this idea of doing this episode when I was recently interviewed by Drew over at Kittle. And uh, he asked me a question that made me think, okay, I, th I think I need to describe this to everyone in our world too, not just in the Kittle world, because, well, a lot of people aren't talking about this. And really our philosophy, you know, our mindset as far as like what we've been doing and well, it's working pretty well. So I thought, you know what, let's go ahead and let's do a full dedicated live stream and, uh, and we'll be able to talk about it because I think it's really, really important to dig into, well, what we're calling the Etsy formula for 2024 to get more sales. All right. So Chris, are you ready to dive in and get rocking and rolling? I, I can't believe we're talking about 2024 already, which is kind of crazy. I know. I just, I just literally today realized that Thanksgiving is next Thursday. It is right. Like we're we're kind of at the end of 2023 already, which sounds mind boggling Insane. to say because it feels like it just started. Um, I guess, and we don't like write dates anymore. But I'd probably still be that person writing 2022 on everything. Uh, but the the thing that's nice, Scott, is even as the years change, uh, even as algorithms change, even as the tools we have at our disposal change. There's a lot of things that stay the same. <clears throat> and what we did in coming up with this formula was we took a look at what not only has worked on Etsy and what will work on Etsy, but also what has worked traditionally on other marketplaces, other platforms, and in other businesses, kind of regardless of platform. And for 2024, obviously, we're looking at this through the lens of what's really working and what will continue to work on Etsy. But the thing is, all five of these principles that are in this formula or all five parts of this formula really apply whether you're selling on Etsy, Amazon, Shopify, wherever you have your stuff to sell online. These five things, uh, and I know I just made four, but there's five. Uh, these five things really do apply across platform. And I think that's the thing I want a lot of people to, to kind of take away from this. Yes, this will work on Etsy. This formula is designed to work specifically with Etsy, but these principles are really much more timeless than even what we're talking about here for what's going to work in 2024. We're just looking at it through the filter and giving you the filter of what's specifically working on Etsy. The principles, the, the parts themselves work kind of timelessly, which I think is something that's really nice. Yeah, no, it's, it's really nice because once again, we don't have to worry about like what's working like right now. Like, yes, this is working, but there's a lot of other things that are working right now now. And what we want to do is focus on things that aren't just going to work now, but they're going to work well into the future. And that's what we talk about here on, uh, on the brand creators, YouTube channel inside of the rock, your brand group. Like we always, always have been talking about really these principles. It's just now they're seeming more important than ever. So with that all being said, we are going to dig in, but what I want you guys to do for me right now is let me know in the comments are you just starting to sell this year, like right now, moving into 2024? Let us know if you are a new seller or if you've already been selling for a little while. I would love to know that. The other thing I wanted to say here before we do dive in is we've got a little bit of an announcement and uh, it actually comes at a great time because we're talking about this right here, right now. And that is we are officially... Now that, uh, well, it's been voted on, we are officially going to be teaching a brand new workshop, which is going to cover basically everything that we're talking about. And we're going to go deep, deep inside of all of this. That's really kind of worked for us. I don't even want to say kind of, it has worked for us. And, uh, the reason why we decided that we're going to do a brand new workshop before 2024 is so this way here, we can let others know before January 1st. And we are going to be teaching this. It's going to be probably about a two or a three hour 
class. And uh, we are going to be breaking down each and every one of these steps. If you're interested in joining us, we haven't even announced the name yet. We do have the name. We're pretty sure on the name. We haven't even announced the name yet. Uh, but we are going to be teaching this thing live. It's going to be the first part of December, the first week of December, really. And uh, the first full week, we haven't decided on the exact date yet, but it's going to be the first full week in December. If you're interested in attending this, what I would do right now is, or when you're done watching this is just email us at support at brandcreators.com. Okay. So send an email to support at brandcreators.com and let us know that you're interested in attending this live workshop. If you're watching this later, it's okay because we are going to be making this available as a product that we're going to be offering in the future. It's going to be so affordable. It's going to be something that's going to help a lot of Etsy sellers, especially the ones that have been struggling or the ones that are just starting. Um, all right. So with that all being said, there you go. Big announcement. Chris and I just decided this about a week and a half ago. We polled the audience and we've had almost a hundred people right now that raised their hand and said, yes, please do this. So we are going to do it. All right. So if you're interested, let us know. You could also drop it in the comments. Let us know that you're interested and uh, we can go ahead and uh, we can make a note of that. All right. So let's dig in. The very first part of this formula, the very first part of this formula, and the reason why I'm saying the very first part, it has to happen. If this does not happen, everything else that we're going to be talking about doesn't work. Okay. And what we're talking about is, and you probably already heard me say this, probably, I don't know, a thousand times is we need to focus on one niche, okay? Or niche, 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 whichever one you want to focus on, all right? But no, seriously, that's what we're talking about. And I know people are going to be saying, yes, Scott, we've heard you say this and we get it, but we're struggling with finding the niche. We're, we're struggling. You know, how do we, how do we only target one customer when there's so many other people that are saying, go out there and just throw a whole bunch of spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks and then just find those, those jackpot products, right? I'm here to tell you that is not a great strategy now or moving into 2024. And one of the big reasons is, is because exactly that it's a one hit wonder. If, if you're, it's like playing the lottery, you're going to maybe win it once and it might not be a big win. It might be like, you know what? You just did a scratch off. You spent 15, 20 bucks or even $5 and you won a hundred bucks. And you're like, yeah, all right. I'm going to keep playing because I might win that thousand or I might win the hundred thousand. Or I might win the million, right? But chances are, you're probably not going to hit a big, big, big jackpot. We all know that, right? You might hit little ones along the way, but wouldn't you rather put time and energy into something that can continually grow? And what I mean by that is when you're focusing on a niche, you're now, you're a business that is, is focusing on one person, one type of customer. And I don't mean just one person, but I mean that person that is interested in that topic or in that thing. So a great example is a wedding niche. And if you're focusing on that, you have a lot of different options, a lot of different products that that customer can buy now and buy in the future, or you can sell them multiple things. I can't stress it enough that when you are doing it this way, you are now building a real business. And what I mean by a real business is a business that also, if you were to move it off of Etsy, you could technically take that business and you could throw all your products on Shopify or, uh, you know, any, any of the e-commerce platforms, there's a whole bunch of them out there, but we like Shopify. And if you put your Shopify up your storefront and you got all your products, an e-commerce store, people are going to be able to come in there and they're going to be able to go through and buy more than one thing. And then we start looking at like average courts, uh, a cart size, <laughs> our court, a cart size. We're, we're looking at how can we increase the order value? How can we increase how much one customer is buying or when they come back to buy? Now I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but this is why if we don't do this, if you just go and you throw, uh, you know, 50 different shirt designs in 50 different niches, right? You don't really have anything other than you hope that one product sells and maybe one takes off. And then what's going to happen most likely mark my words. If you do have a product that takes off, 
you're probably going to see that product start to dwindle because everyone else is going to come in and copy you, right? So then you're always trying to find that next jackpot, that next, you know, that next lottery ticket that's a winner. We don't want to do that. So we don't focus on that ever. We don't ever go after a product just because of the sales numbers. We go after the product that yes, has sales numbers, has demand. We go after the product that can also add to our product line, which we'll talk about. So Chris, anything you wanted to bring up there or anything that I might've left out as far as like that one there, like that is the number one thing that we need to do is we need to do niche validation and know the, the, the market and the niche that we're going after and knowing that we can sell products over and over and over again to that same customer. What'd you want to add, Chris? I think there's, there's two things. First of all, Scott, what is and what is not a niche? And you gave kind of the, the broad definition of what that is, right? We don't want to be selling 50 different t-shirts to 50 different groups of people. And really what a niche is, is something someone can identify as or says that they are. Right. So I am a fisherman. I like fishing. Right. They can identify, they can say that they like it. You wouldn't say, I am a t shirt. You might say, I like t shirts, but that doesn't tell you what kind of t shirts you like. It doesn't say uh, why you like that t shirt. Right. It feels weird. I love lamp. Right. The, uh, the example from Anchorman. You wouldn't necessarily say that. It doesn't make sense as a sentence. You would say, I like fishing or I like fishing shirts. And so what you're looking for is really an interest-based store. Now, if you have a product-based store, meaning you made, and I'm going to go ahead and call it what I believe to be a mistake, Scott, of launching 50 different t-shirts and 50 different niches, right? To 50 different groups of people. Um, you can still pull that back into a niche-based store by looking at what has sold the best for you so far and focusing just on that group of products moving forward. And a lot of people, Scott, and I want to get your take on this, will say, well, doesn't that limit my customer base? So I want to come back to that in just a second. But why do we advocate so heavily for the niche-based approach, especially on Etsy, especially as we move into 2024? Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. One, and you just alluded to it, we don't have to always compete for more customers. We don't have to compete for every customer in our niche. Once we get somebody on the list that they bought from us, they're going to come back and buy from us again and again and again. And Scott, correct me if I'm wrong on this number, but I believe you posted a screenshot yesterday of November sales year over year, and they are up 70%? Yeah, uh, as of yesterday over it year. was. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of that comes from existing customers, right? Because we're sending email, we're driving them back. And if we just have a generic t-shirt store, yes, some of them will go find our new bass fishing shirt right. by digging through nine pages of all of the products. But if every product we have in the store is relevant to their interest, they're much more likely to buy something from us. Reason number two, not only that it's you know kind of the recommended approach because we don't have to compete for more customers, it's easier to create products, but reason number two, especially in the Etsy ecosystem, really started at the end of last year, beginning of this year, 2023, where Etsy said they're like double, tripling, quadrupling down on brands. They want brands to come to the platform. Why? Because they realize exactly the same thing that we were talking about in reason number one. Etsy's job as a platform is to generate more sales. And they really only have two levers to do that. They can drive more traffic or they can get more people that have bought from them in the past to buy from them, right? It's the same conundrum that we are in as brand owners. And so what Etsy has done throughout 2023 is they've made the, the platform a lot more brand friendly. And one of the things, and we have some comments that are going on right now in the live chat talking about you know, I have a t-shirt shop and I'm noticing some weird things. I've seen a lot of talk about it in the Facebook group recently. And almost all of those shops that I have seen are on the product-based model rather than the niche-based model. And they're saying ads aren't working for me this year the same way that they were last year on, you know, my bass fishing t-shirt or my whatever t-shirt. And the reason for that is somebody came in and undercut them on price. And so that listing is now outperforming. If we use the brand-based approach, the niche based approach, we no longer have to worry about competing on price because that person is going to come in on the product that they are searching for. We're not just trying to show up for bass fishing t-shirt. We might have one, but there's a million other ways that they can come in and find our brand where there's not as much competition at a cheap price where people may be tempted into buying that. And once they come in and they purchase from us, they're a lot less 
price sensitive. So for me, the niche based approach makes it easier as a brand owner. And it's something that's being massively encouraged by Etsy. And I think in 2024, we're going to start to see some shifts even in the algorithm that are starting to favor that. And people have talked about the, the shop score and individual listing scores and how that factors into SEO on Etsy. And we don't have time to dive into all of that. But if Etsy knows and is easily able to identify the customer who is most likely to buy from you, and they look at other customers' buyer history for the customization of search results, which we know that they do, if we can give Etsy really clean data to say, if somebody likes phishing, they like my stuff. That makes it a lot easier for Etsy to show our listings organically. It makes ads work better. It makes people less price sensitive. And it makes us have to compete less on the front end for any customer that we can get because we're very laser focused on getting specific customers and then growing sales from those customers over time. So we don't have to launch as many products. We don't have to be as competitive. And we can just sit down and focus on the things that really matter. Yeah. And that kind of leads us into the second thing in this in this formula. And that is developing product lines. Like if you don't do what we just said, and I'm not saying you have to do it, but what I'm saying, that's what we do. And, you know, part of this, this new workshop that we're going to be putting together, this class is going to be going through how to find the niche and then how to build out the niche and like what we've done. So all we're really doing in this class is we are reverse engineering what we've done and how it's working. Right. And then how to do all of these other, other steps. And the second part here is your product line. So imagine that you don't have a single customer in mind and you're doing the spaghetti approach, right? Where you're just throwing stuff up and seeing what sticks or the lottery approach. We can call it whatever we want. You guys get the idea. But if we're doing that, we don't have a product line. All we have are products, right? A product line means that if, if I'm coming in and I'm a wedding customer and I'm looking for, I don't know, uh, maybe it's, uh, you know, bridal party, uh, you know, shirts or, uh, bachelorette shirts, right. That are going to be matching, or they're going to have a certain saying on them or whatever. Right. I know that that person's having a wedding, right. Or I know that that's a wedding planner, or I know that that person is the bride, right. What else could I sell that, that bride or the people that are organizing the wedding? Like what, that's what I'm thinking about now, right? I'm not thinking about, oh, bass fishing and then wedding and then baby. And then, uh, you know, all of the different, the, the, you know, the different areas that I could go because I was doing some research and I saw that something's really selling and it's taking off or there's this trend coming and I'm going to go ahead and tap into this trend because it's, it's happening right? Like right now. And that's what I'm going to base all my decision on. So we've always stayed away from that. The only thing that we've ever done, you do product research, but we stay within our lane, right? We stay there and then we just keep building it out. Now, does this mean that you can't, you can't go after sub niches? Absolutely. I just kind of did right. Wedding high level. Okay. And now you, if you imagine you go down there, you go, what, what else do you got? You got engagement, right? You've got a bachelorette party. You got a bachelor party. You, you can you can also sell stuff for the him, right? And all of that stuff. Um, you've got uh, flower girls, right? You've got ring bearer. You got all of these different things. What else happens? So that's what we're talking about as far as sub niching down. It doesn't have to mean like I I only can go after um, the bride, right? And that's all I can do. And or I can only go after uh, you know, all of the, uh, you know, the wedding party, you go after all of that stuff, but you just kind of start to branch out. You start in one area. And then from there, you start to kind of, you know, bring out the branches of that brand. And then you can even go sub sub niche. Okay. Because now you could say, well, okay, we're all, we're in the wedding niche and stuff, but you know, there is going to be some people that are going to be having babies. So maybe you have something there for, maybe you don't start and add the baby stuff, but you're going to probably have someone that already has a baby and getting married. So they might need something, right? So I'm just going through like really the brainstorming on how we think, right? Like how do we focus on that one customer and what happens in that customer's world, uh, you know, 
for whatever they are uh, going to be doing or if they're going to be buying a gift for someone. Because that's the other thing too, right? If someone's having a wedding and you have the bride, well, maybe I'm going to focus on the grandparents of the bride too. And maybe I'm going to, um, maybe I'm going to focus on the father of the bride, right? So there's all these different things, right? And I can go on and on and on, but I want to go through this entire formula with you guys. But creating the product line, like thinking like a business would, right? How can we take a customer and lead them in with a product that might have a lot of demand, but then we have these other products that don't in search, right? Or, or in the, in, in the tool doesn't have a whole bunch of demand, but I know that if they came in my shop there, there's a possibility that they would buy. Why wouldn't I add that? Right? So it takes the pressure off of just finding these products that are just exploding. And it also eliminates a lot of that competition. So product lines are big. All right. Because now we increase that value of that cart and we also create new things for people to buy the following year. So product lines are going to be super, super important. Anything else there, Chris, you want to add in there before we move on to the third piece here? Yeah. So Scott, what is, what is the easiest way to create a product line? Cause everybody knows that they should launch more products. And I think the mistake that we see most often here is that people only focus on launching new designs. And that's why they, a lot of times will go away from that, that step one in this formula. And they say, well, you know, I just don't have enough ideas about kayak bass fishing to create more designs. And it's not always about creating more designs. The very first thing I would be doing if I'm trying to create a product line is looking at what's selling and looking for two things. So if we have a, uh, a kayak bass fishing t-shirt that's selling really well, we're going to one, take that design and apply it to other products. We immediately have expanded our product line. Well, why would somebody who already has the bass fishing t-shirt buy that same design on something else? If they like it, they will put it on other things, right? People have t-shirts and pillows and blankets that all have the same design on it. Maybe they just want everything to match all of those things. But also maybe somebody likes the design, but they don't wear t-shirts. So they'll buy it on a pillow, they'll buy it on a blanket. And guess what? It takes us all of five minutes and 20 cents to create and test that inside of our Etsy shop. Thing number two that I would be doing is then looking at how to create new designs based off what we know is selling. And one of the easiest ways to do that, Scott, would be to have what, I, what I'm calling seasonal takes on a product. So if we have a design that's selling really well all year round, can we repurpose that design to be a Christmas kayak bass fishing t-shirt or a Halloween kayak bass fishing t-shirt? And if we can throw a Santa hat or a ghost costume or something over the, the bass fish and it still works, or we can add in some seasonal elements, then we can easily take a design that we already know works and do that. And then the next thing that I would be looking at would be just coming up with brand new creative ideas. But realistically, one of the easiest ways to dramatically expand your product line is to take existing designs, make small tweaks to them to make them seasonal, to make them repurchasable by your audience, and then applying those designs to new product types to let people take their favorite designs with them in whatever format they choose to do so. Yeah. It's really, really important because that there's a, that there's a pro move guys, because that there, it allows you to work on something, really make it great. Even if, even if you purchased uh, a design that you paid someone, like you hired someone, uh, maybe you went to Fiverr or maybe you went to Upwork and you hired a designer to create this design and you, you paid a hundred bucks for the design. You own it now right? Why not take that and leverage it on all of these different products that you have access to? Now they have to make sense. Like Chris said, you know, are we going to put something on a shower curtain always? No, it would have to make sense, right? We could, I mean, I have the option to do that. If I go to Printify, I can look at shower curtains and, uh, you know, different things for the home, but it doesn't necessarily maybe make sense. So what I want to do is I want to look at it and go, okay, if someone purchased a flag for their home. Well, could I put it on a garden flag too? Probably because maybe someone doesn't want the big flag. They want the small flag. Okay, there we go. Two products. Uh, let's see here. What else could we put that on? Oh, it's a cute design. Maybe we put that on a pillow and someone might want to use it in their, in their home. Maybe it's seasonal, right? And you're like, oh, now I can put it on the flag. I can put it on the yard garden flag and I can put it on the pillow. Uh, let, let's see where else, what else could we do? Oh, maybe we could put it on a blanket. 
right? So all of a sudden I've taken one product or I'm sorry, one design and I've leveraged it on all these other, other different products. Now you might go, but Scott, I, I looked at the, at the, at the uh, results as far as, you know, people buying this stuff. And I don't see a lot of, a lot of people buying the blanket. So what, what's it cost you? You know, not much to, to list it. And you can go ahead and just have it in your inventory. Literally 20 cents, right? Like that's, that's what we're there talking about. And especially when you combine this with number three and four that we're going to be talking about here in a minute, the overall demand for repurposing a, a design doesn't really matter. Because if we sell one blanket one time to somebody that's bought from us in the past, that pays for that 20 cents and five minutes that it took us to set up the listing. Right. I don't know about you, uh, but if I could make twenty dollars in profit for spending five minutes doing something, I would probably do that. I'm not great at math. Somebody do the math in the chat. If you could make twenty dollars every five minutes, what would that work out to be an hour? Um, that's decent. I mean, it'd be what two hundred, two hundred fifty bucks an hour, or two hundred forty dollars an hour, or something like that. Somebody correct my math on that. Uh, but you know, like this is one of the easiest ways to expand stuff, and the overall demand when you're repurposing. The design doesn't matter as much because of what we're talking about here in number three and number four. Yeah. All right. So we are going to move into number three. Like I said, guys, we've got a, we got a lot to cover here, and I want to get through every component here of this formula for 2024 to really increase your sales and have steady sales, but also just have a a thriving brand because that's the way we look at it. And you don't hear this talked about a lot. Here's what I want you to do though, before we move forward here in the comments right now, and I don't care if you're here live or if you're here watching this on the replay, it doesn't matter if it's a month from now, two months, six months, I don't really care. I want to know this for you. Like right now, what is holding you back from doing this? Like right now, let us know in the comments, what is holding you back? What is the sticking point for you to not make this type of business model work for you. Just curious. I want to put it in there. Also, it'll help us possibly create some new videos, some help, and uh, we can go ahead and possibly create some here for the channel. All right. So if you would do that, that would be awesome. All right. So moving on to number three. So we talked about number one, finding a good niche and then focusing there. Yes, we're going to do sub niches and all of that stuff that's within that niche, but that's the, that's the, the main thing we need to do. Once we do that, now we're developing products. We're going to create products that that one customer would be interested in. Bottom line. Okay. Done. Three email. Again, it's not being talked about, right? Like people don't realize how important email marketing can be for your business. I mean, we shared a case study here of us sending email for 30 days and we did over $3,000. It was actually $3,177 in 30 days, all from sending email. Okay. Just email. So the power in this is imagine having your customers on an email list, but also there's other ways that you can build your email list. You can run a giveaway and offer, uh, offer them for free in a giveaway and get attention that way. That's what we do. We actually have a whole free uh, workshop training that goes over that. It's called the one day email list. I'll give a little shameless plug. It's free. <laughs> you can buy it. We do it. We do have it available for purchase, but if you want to receive that for free, uh, there's a couple things that you need to do. One of them is you need to sign up for Everbee. Uh, and if you do that, you'll go ahead and, uh, you'll be able to get access to that for free. So, uh, basically just get on the growth plan. You can do that by going over to email You sign up there, you send us an email support at brandcreators.com, And then we will send you that training, which is about 12 videos. And it walks you through how to set up a giveaway, how to get traffic and how to build that email list. So it doesn't just have to be your customers, but when you do have customers, we want those people to get on our email list so we can, we can message them and we can follow up with them. All right. And if you're not building your business as a brand and it's just a, you know, throw stuff at the wall brand, don't worry about building an email list because it's not really going to help you. Right. So my, my, my point in saying it that way is 
if you are building a brand, this is powerful because again, just imagine being able to write an email, letting people know about a new item. Maybe, maybe you just, you just launched a new item and you want to let people know about it and you're excited about it. Maybe you're going to do a 50% off for the first 24 hours to kind of boost the sales, get yourself ranking real quick. Maybe that's what you're going to do. You see the power in that? And then how about this? People uh, can now get a message from you immediately. You can automate this in Everbee email, by the way, which is, again, if you go through that link there, you'll go ahead and be able to try that all out. You actually get a month free, I think, if you go through that link, emailforshops.com. And they even have it now where we're auto follow up, following up with these people before they're an email subscriber. And let me just say, this has been amazing. I mean, Chris, I haven't even shared the numbers with you, but I mean, we're getting emails every single day of people saying, thanks so much for following up. Thanks so much for, for reaching out. I love the item that I got. I just left a review. So all of these things are awesome because it helps build our brand and it helps get more sales. It helps get reviews. But what's even more powerful is a lot of these people become email subscribers that we get to follow up with. Right. And I can't tell you how many people say, I can't wait to give this gift away. And I can't wait to share your shop with my sister, or I can't wait to, uh, you know, buy for, you know, next Christmas and give, you know, everyone a gift or whatever. Like you're getting people saying, I want to buy again. Right. And that's really, really powerful. So I'm not going to go too deep into that. We did a whole workshop, uh, a free workshop actually here. Uh, what was it? A couple of weeks ago. You'll find that here on the YouTube channel. So if you go under the live tab, you'll see a live there that we did that was actually going through that case study where we, where we made $3,177. You can go check that out later. All right. So let me know though, in the comments as well, how many of you right now are using email in your Etsy business? Like, I'm just curious how many of you right now, drop it in the comments, are using email right now in your business? Let us know. Chris, I know we could go for hours on this topic, but if you could sum it up, is there anything else that I would, yeah, you, you need a little something. Let, let me know. It, what did I miss out of that? Nothing other than generally speaking, right from a, an e-commerce perspective, which if you're selling on Etsy you're an e-commerce business, right? Whether you have your own website or not. Email is the single most effective return on investment marketing activity that you can conduct, right? Hands down, period. Why? There's a fixed cost and an unlimited scalable return to it, right? You have, if you have less than 500 emails, it's included with Everbee for free. If you have more than that, then they start to charge you, but you're gonna be making money with it anyway. So you know what that is. There's no ads associated with it, right? There's no variable cost. You're not competing with anybody. It's just you and your list. And on top of that, Scott, if we're looking at this from the Etsy perspective, not the general perspective, the only thing the Etsy algorithm really cares about is how likely your product is to sell if they show it to someone. How do they determine that? How many people came to the listing? How many people bought the listing? That's pretty much it. I mean, it's there's a lot more factors that go into it, but that's really what it boils down to. Who are the people who are most likely to convert when they visit your product? Your existing customers. So if you want a listing to rank really well, the very first thing I would be doing is sending an email to my list of existing customers to drive some of them over. Even if it's not thousands of people, in a lot of cases on Etsy, if you get 10, 15, 20 people and a handful of sales from that listing, you'll start to see that skyrocket before you can even turn ads on, right? You can send an email and drive that traffic and start getting sales before you can even add that to your Etsy ads campaign. And that will just add fuel to the fire. So if you're not using email, you're missing out on what I believe to be one of the biggest shortcuts to the SEO algorithm on Etsy, which is driving the most qualified traffic and the most qualified people that then result in sales and kick off that SEO flywheel that you and I talk about so much. So if you're not doing it, start doing it. Absolutely. And if you want to get started, a little shameless plug, head on over to email shops.com. Okay. Email shops.com. Sign up there. You will actually get a free month going through that link. And once you do, then I want you to send an email to us over at support 
at brandcreators.com and we will send you a little, little email marketing bundle. Uh, we're going to send you some templates that you can plug right into Everbee email. There's also a uh, profit push campaign that we use. Part of that $3,177 was one of those profit pushes. So we give you that, which has all the emails. And then also we give you that free course, which is legit. Like we're, we're actually, if you don't want to pay for Everbee and you just want to go through that course, you can, you can go over to our website and you can purchase it for right now. It's at $97. Um, so it's up to you. I would definitely be building that list though, as soon as possible. All right, let's keep rolling here. All right. So this, the, I was going to say the second piece, but there's two parts to this. No, the fourth piece, there's two parts to the fourth piece. All right. And that is traffic. All right. So traffic, there's two parts. There's free traffic, which is your organic traffic. And that's what everyone talks about, right? They're like, yep, just go ahead and get that SEO going, baby. And you're going to have sales, right? Not really. Okay. Number one, if you optimize really well and you, you go through all the steps, right? You have a good title, good images. You've got good tags, good description, all of the basics, right? You got it all down. Yes. You can start to get some free traffic, but if you're competing with anyone else out there, well, they probably have the same. So how is it going to be decided by Etsy that they show you above them? Well, the way that they're going to do it is you need to get some sales, right? So you might be saying, well, Scott, then how do you get sales? Well, we use Etsy ads to basically allow us to get sales and we discount our product in the beginning and we do a whole launch process, but using these two together, it to me is the way that you're going to be able to rise above the competition and you're going to be able to dominate your niche because you need traffic. You can have the products. They can be great. Your, your stuff can look the best, but if no one sees it, no one can buy it, right? So we need to get traffic. So yes, we're going to optimize it for SEO, right? Search engine optimization. Yes, we're going to do that. And yes, we're going to get traffic from that, but we're going to speed up that process by pouring gas on the fire and putting some ad dollars to it. It doesn't have to be a lot. It can be five bucks a day. We just need something to let Etsy get this in front of our buyers as soon as possible. It's almost like you're at Disney and you take one of those fast passes. And I don't think it's called a fast pass anymore. It's called something else. But it's like, hey, you can wait in the line for everyone else for an hour and 45 minutes. Or you can go here in the, hot, in, in, in the little uh, speed uh, line here and you can pay 15 bucks and we'll get you right up to the front 10 minutes. It's up to you. You know, what do, what do, you, what do you prefer? Uh, depends on the ride, you know, but for the most part, I'm paying the 15 bucks. I want to go on more. I want to see more. I don't want to wait in line. It's kind of what's happening here in Etsy, right? You can do it. They'll show you eventually, maybe, maybe not, right? Maybe a little bit and test it out. But if we can go ahead and just speed up that process and use Etsy ads, that's what we're going to do. And I know a lot of people, what they're going to say, but Scott, I want to wait until I start making money before I actually start spending money on ads. And to me, that is the wrong mindset. And if you're looking for, well, how, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to get some money to, to do this. Like get a hundred bucks, right? We all can probably clear out our basement, our attic, our garage and sell a hundred dollars worth of stuff on eBay or Facebook marketplace. I mean, let's face it, get a hundred bucks and drop it into some ads to get things rolling. But you also need to treat this like a business. And that's what we've done right from the beginning. Okay. Because we've built brands in the past is yes, it takes some money. It doesn't take as much money as it does to start an Amazon FBA business, right? There you're talking, you got to get real inventory. We're talking print on demand or digital. So my thing here, really, really stress this is when we get to this stage, we got everything going, right? We're, we're moving in the right direction. We got to get traffic. We got to get sales. And that's the way that we do it. SEO, of course, but then we add a little a little gas on that fire and we, we run some Etsy ads. Okay. And because we have an email list, we had a little bit more gas there too. Okay. So those are the three different sources, but it's kind of in that order. So Chris, anything I missed on that that you wanted to address before we move on to the fifth and final? I think the biggest thing here, Scott, by the way, I think they call it the genie pass. 
now. Uh, my brother was there this year and said that they were going through some sort of like rebranding for that, which I guess that's more on brand with Disney anyway, right? Uh, you get instantly transported onto your favorite ride. But I think in terms of traffic, right, everybody wants the free traffic. But the thing that they don't consider is that getting anybody to your listing should not be the goal. And it's one of the reasons you and I like niching down. We don't have to compete for t-shirt. We can compete for Christmas bass fishing t-shirt, ideal for people who love bass fishing and hunting, right? We can compete at that level. The goal should be to get the most qualified traffic. Over time, that will happen with SEO. The way to shortcut that process is to run Etsy ads. At the beginning, Etsy will go out and show you for a lot more keywords than they would show you for on the organic side because you're willing to pay for it. So they're willing to take the chance that you're not as qualified for that particular keyword. But even after you've run ads for just a few days, you get to start to really see what they're showing you for. And if they're showing you generically for t-shirt, you go in and you turn that off and you start to be able to guide the Etsy algorithm to the people who are going to buy your shirt. Are there people who like bass fishing who also would type in t-shirt on Etsy? Yes, but there's a, a million other things that they could mean when they type that in. The thing I want to be shown for is bass fishing t-shirt, Christmas bass fishing t-shirt. And I'm able to guide the Etsy algorithm by driving that qualified traffic from the email list, by sculpting the keywords I'm showing for in ads and showing them that I am relevant for those things by driving traffic from those keywords using ads and getting sales from those keywords using ads. And that will shortcut the process on the organic side. And then we can shortcut the general SEO process by driving the traffic from the email list. They'll just say, hey, people like this product when we put it in front of them and they'll start giving you more chances. Here's here's the thing I wanna say here before we move on to the, to the last little piece here, which is really important by the way, is you gotta realize moving into 2024, it's gonna get harder. Okay. And I mean, harder for people that are just following the chase, the trends, uh, launch a t-shirt shop, launch a digital printable shop. Um, like that's going to get very, very hard, uh, very, very, uh, it's going to be a lot of competition. Okay. And there's also going to be a lot of, uh, you know, Etsy shops getting shut down because it is throwing kind of crap at the wall, right. Seeing what's sticking. Um, and Etsy doesn't want that, right? You got to remember Etsy, they think about their customer. Okay. They probably think about their customer more than they think about you, right? As a seller, because they want to make sure that their, their customer that comes on their platform is happy and they're getting the Etsy experience. Right. And you got to, re got to remember way back Etsy was all handmade, right? It's all that, that you could sell. You couldn't sell digital. You couldn't sell print on demand. Right. But now we can. But they're also realizing that there's a flood of people coming in and they need to start getting a handle on that. So the other thing to think about, and just, I mean, think about this logically for a second. If you're going to go in there and just kind of like, I'm going to go in there, put up free, and I'm going to do my stuff. I'm going to put stuff in there and try to get free traffic. And I'm not going to build an email list until I get a little extra money. And I'm, you got to remember, there's going to be people like me and Chris and my wife building a brand that we're going to do all that other stuff. So it's going to be harder for the person not doing this. And there's going to be a lot less of these, these little hidden gem of these, you know, these products that you can tap into. Are people still going to be teaching it and, and sharing that that's the way to do it? Of course, but I want to be the voice and Chris wants to be the voice of that's not the way that's going to make a lasting business. Okay. It just isn't, it's, it's going to be really, really risky. And in 2024, it's going to get harder if you're trying to follow that model. And if you follow what we're saying, you're actually going to be building momentum. And the bigger that you build your email list, the more that you start getting sales, it's going to be even harder for someone to compete with you. Right? So just a big, big takeaway there. And hopefully, hopefully that got your wheels turning and let us know in the comments, does this make sense for you? And is this something that you'd think about possibly uh, entertaining in the future. So Chris, what you Scott, got to, to sum that up quickly and go back to your analogy, what you're saying is you would rather pay a little bit of money for that genie pass to be able to ride whatever ride you want in your own time, 
rather than ride It's a Small World 500 times waiting for everybody else to lead the park. Is that kind of where you were going with that? You'd rather That's invest exactly. a little bit of money to be able to do what you want to do when you want to do it, rather than waiting for everybody else to leave the park while you ride It's a Small World over and over and over. <laughs> I do love the ride. It brings back a lot of memories as a kid, but I only want to ride that one once. And I want to go on all of the other, the other newer ones and the fun ones that everyone else wants to go on too. Right. It's kind of like, think about that. And I love this analogy because think about the, the flood of people that are sitting there in line waiting to go on this, this ride. They want to get there, but there's also that, that genie pass now that we can take and we can get up and cut line. Right. That's how I look at it. And that's a great analogy. So yes, Chris, I will take the genie line every single time. And I'm going to figure that into my trip, by the way, which you should be figuring that in on your Etsy startup, right? It doesn't have to be a lot. Like I said, two bucks a day, five bucks a day on ads goes a long way, right? That you're at least getting exposure. And, and I can't prove this. I do think that if you do that, it also signals Etsy and it lets them know in a sense, their algorithm that this shop is actually spending money to get visibility too. So they're a serious business. So let's take them a little bit more serious and let's, let's try to help them. Right. I can't prove that, but that's just a hunch of mine. All right, let's move on to the fifth and final step in this formula, which I think is a really, really big one. And that is customer support. And why this is so big is because when we are building a brand, and we want repeat customers, guess what? We want those customers to be happy, right? We want those customers to be raving about us, right? And so the way you do that is you communicate with those people. And that's really all support is to me. Like support is if someone messages you, you need to message them back, right? There's even a thing now inside of the back end of Etsy that if you're not able to, uh, to get back with them, maybe you had to step out, you can put an auto message in there that lets them know, Hey, I stepped away, but I'm going to get back to you as soon as I can. And we've even done it where we're like, Hey, um, you know, I, I had to step out. Uh, I'm taking my, my uh, daughter to beach volleyball practice. I should be back in the next couple of hours. I'll message you then. Right? So there's things that you can do that you don't have to be on your phone every five seconds but you do want to make sure that you're communicating with these people because the person or the company that communicates the fastest is probably going to make more sales. We've all done it. Here's another one for you. I was recently looking for someone to detail my car, you know, reached out to a few. And guess what? The one that messaged me back the quickest, I went with them. It was on, it was on Facebook messenger too, by the way. Right? So you probably can say the same thing, right? You're probably looking for a contractor, right? You're waiting for someone to get back to you. The one that gets back to you, generally going to go with that person. Obviously, you gotta, you're going to look at their reviews and you're going to see all that other stuff, but everything checks out. Kind of going with the ones that kind of get back to you as quick as possible. And again, you need, to, you need to like the product. I'm not saying you can have a crappier product, but you have better customer service. It's not how it works. But any good business, you know, has great customer support, right? And also I think having that customer support in the beginning is where you want to be the one doing it and letting people know like, Hey, you know, it's, it's Scott. I, I just want to let you know, like, you know, we have a small business here. We really appreciate everything that you do. If there's anything else I can help you with. So like our follow-up sequence that we send to all of our new customers, now that we have ever be email, it automates that. And guys, by the way, I give you all these templates. So if you want them once again, just Sign up for Everbe through our link, email for shops.com and send us an email at support at brandcreators.com and we'll send you those. But those there have been doing so well and it's automated. It's like I have a, a virtual uh, little uh, sales person, not even a sales person, a support person that I set up once and I just, I, I told them what to say in my voice. It's exactly what I did. And now that's happening every single day. When a new order comes in, boom, first message, order confirmation. The second one is, Hey, your item has been shipped. The third one, your item has been delivered. The one that says your item's been delivered has been incredible. Like we get replies that say, Hey, thanks so much for reaching out. I really appreciate it. And yes, we love our gift or yes, we love our garden flag. It's going to be so great. I can't wait to put it out and I'll be back to buy more. And I just left you a review. 
Not kidding, guys. That, that's what's happening with that third message. It's crazy. A lot of people have said, well, doesn't Etsy already email my customers? Yeah, they do. And guess what? It probably goes to the spam folder and people probably never look at it. And if they do get it, it's like, oh, it's just a generic one from Etsy. This is personalized. And by the way, we're also asking them to join our VIP list where they can get special, uh, you know, giveaways and promotions and things that we're doing in the future. Right. So all of that stuff's automated now, but then on the back end, you know, my, my wife is answering support questions, especially now because of, of the holidays, right? Like asking questions and then getting them answered huge. So customer support, big, very, very big. Anything you want to add to that, Chris? No, I think the, the biggest thing there is you're trying to create the long-term customer value and having basic customer service will help you with that. The biggest complaint we hear from people, Scott, is that I can't be on my phone 24 seven, or I can't always have it with me. That's where the automatic messaging comes in and you just respond to it as soon as you can on the back end. People, especially on Etsy, are typically very understanding as long as you have a legitimate reason, right? I'm doing stuff with my family, legitimate reason. I needed a mental health break, legitimate reason, right? Just tell them why and when you'll get back to them. And then the key to that, Scott, is get back to them when you tell them you're going to get back to them, right? That's 99.9% .9 of it. If you can do that, you'll get more sales. You'll also create longer term customers. Yeah. And I, again, I'll just, I'll leave it at that. Like customer support is big and it's underutilized. Uh, so definitely, definitely something that you should be focusing on and you should be focusing on that in the, the upcoming year as well. So recap real quick. Number one, okay. In order to succeed in 2024 on Etsy, in our opinion, okay, just our opinion is to build a brand. And the way that you do that is step one, is you're going to really focus on one niche. And then from there, you're going to build out a product line, right? And then you're going to sell those products to those people. And hopefully you're going to increase the order value because you have more than one thing that they can buy, right? Third, we're going to email. We're going to start using email. We're going to start, we're going to set our automation up. So that way there, that's working in the background. So this way we can, we can be sending emails to our customers as they're receiving their order. And then we're going to send out broadcast messages with our email list because, well, we're going to increase sales by letting people know about new products that are released or a, a new promotion or a flash sale, any of that stuff. And then fourth, we are basically now going to be working on traffic. Okay. And some of it we can control and some of it we can't. And that is your SEO search engine optimization. We're going to make sure that our listings are fully optimized. And then we're going to drive traffic to it with Etsy ads. And of course our email list. And then fifth and final is when this is all happening, we're going to have amazing customer support so we can really wow our customers and want them to come back or have them want to come back. I should say. All right. So that is everything in a nutshell. And I'm telling you like that right there is going to be really hard to compete with. And I will tell you this, there's going to be a small fraction of sellers that are actually going to do that. Okay. Which is good news for you and me if we do it. Okay. But if the people that are coming in, they're just starting and they're maybe listening to, you know, and I'm not going to mention any names like, you know, a teacher and Etsy guru. And they're just saying to go out there and launch t-shirts and just keep launching products and just throw spaghetti, throw spaghetti. It's fine. Um, I personally would never want to uh, encourage people to do that because I think it's a very short lived if you get any success at all. And I also think that there's going to be a lot of shops getting shut down. Um, so that's what we believe. That's our model. That's what we're doing. And we're also going to be teaching everything that I just shared, but in greater detail, uh, inside of an upcoming workshop. And it's going to be in the first week of December. If you would like to be part of that, the first one that we do is going to be live and then we're going to record it. And then we're going to offer it later, um, as one of our, as one of our courses. Um, so if you would like to be part of that, you can just reach out to support at brandcreators.com and let us know that you would like to be included when we open the doors for that new workshop. All right. And that's going to be happening. Like I said, first week in December, um, the very first, uh, well, it's the first full week I should say. All right. So with that being said, Chris, 
Anything else we need to address there? I know we're going to go into some questions and we also have some questions that already came in that we want to address. Um, anything else we need to cover there before we move on? I think that's it. We probably want to give everybody just a really quick recap of what that formula is. Portion number one, niche down, right? Find a niche. Thing number two, create product lines, build your email list, drive traffic and focus on customer support. And if you can do those five things, that is going to be the formula, not just for 2023, but for 2024 and beyond. And again, if you guys want to go back and listen to any of those parts in depth to understand exactly what we mean by that, feel free to do that. But just keep those five things in mind and that will get you 99% of the way there. Cool. All right. So let's, let's get into a very, very, a uh, big topic and one that I know a lot of people struggle with. And that is, all right, Scott, I get it. I need to find a niche in order to make this whole thing work. How do I find a good niche? Aren't they all kind of taken? Like there isn't any available anymore. And here's the deal. In order to find a good niche, I don't care if people have already done it. I don't care if it's saturated. All that I care about is that there is demand in this market. Okay. That's all that I care about because I feel like everyone has an opportunity in a niche. You just have to be different. So yes, you will have to have really good designs if you're doing print on demand, right? Or if you're doing digital products, you have to have really good digital products, right? It is going to, you know, it's going to force you to really have good quality stuff. But when you are looking for a niche that you can build a brand in, you want to make sure that it has demand. So I would rather go after one that's really saturated and know that, okay, all I need to do is figure out how to get more attention. And if I do that, then I know that I'm going to get more sales. Like that's what we need to be focusing on. So Another question that I get a lot is like, well, how do I find that niche? Like, how do I do it? The very first thing that I would recommend, this is how we've always done it. In any business that we've built, we've never built a brand just because it was this opportunity, right? We've never done that, okay? Where we're like, we're just going to go on crypto because it's a great thing right now and everyone's talking about it. Like, I have no interest in it. I don't really know enough about it and it just doesn't jive with me, right? So the very first thing you need to do is you need to ask yourself, you need to do some self inventory and see what is it, what is it that, that you feel like, you know what, I could, I could do this every day. Like I really enjoy this niche, right? And a way that you can do that is start unpacking a little bit of what you're into. I always start there, right? If you are someone that is someone that crochets all the time, right? Okay, great. What are you crocheting? right? And you're like, well, I'm doing sweaters and I'm doing this, or maybe you're doing stuff for babies or, you know, like, and you really enjoy that. That's where I would start. I would say, okay, the baby niche is, is really saturated and there's a lot of competition, but maybe you have a unique angle of you, right? Cause no one's going to, no, no one's going to replace you. No one, no one, no one is going to be able to be you. Right. And the, the reason why I say that is because you can have designs that either you create or you can have other people create. Okay. You yourself can be a better product researcher, right. And find little pockets in the market. Right. So to me, you want to be interested in the niche if you can be all right. And if you're not someone else. Okay. Now for me, I'm very fortunate that my wife and I, we, we, like a lot of the same things. So when we're going into something, a lot of times it comes from something that we're doing, something that we're into. Uh, and I'll give you an example. So my daughter is into beach volleyball. So if I was thinking to myself, like, could I do something in beach volleyball? Is there enough demand? Is it big enough? And it might not be, but what I could do is I could start there and then I could start to branch out and go into all of the other sports for youth. Right. So now I took something that, okay, I'm interested in this thing because I love the sport. My daughter's into the sport. I know the things that we're buying her. I know that a lot of her friends and, and teammates, they have all these sayings around beach volleyball. 
So maybe I could create some really cool stuff for that, right? And then I could branch out and do these little sub niches that would be maybe for, I don't know, youth baseball or football, right? And I'd be catering to the youth market, okay? So that's just the way that I always think about it. And if we were doing that, well, I'd be interested in it. My wife would be interested in it. My daughter would even probably want to contribute, right? So now everybody's kind of thinking of like, what could we come up that's really cool? That's really fun, uh, you know? And then we would start to explore what's already selling. Is there anything selling? If there is, what does it look like? Or maybe here's another idea. And I know I'm kind of, I'm kind of, you know, kind of hyped up here because I'm coming up with ideas on the fly is what if, what if I said, you know what, let's find something that's doing good in another uh, shoulder niche, as we call it, uh, like maybe, maybe it's football. Maybe, maybe there's a football saying on a shirt that's, uh, and I'm not talking about like NFL stuff. Cause that's like trademarked that we would never do that. I'm saying like just a saying about football or, you know, like, uh, you know, something about maybe having grit or something. Right. And it's, and, and you know, that a kid would want to wear it, but it's really selling well for youth football. Well, I could take that same, maybe concept and idea and bring it over and do it for, for beach volleyball. Right. So I'm kind of borrowing something from another niche that's doing well and bringing it over and adapting it to my niche. All right. So if you are struggling to find a niche, that's what I would do. I would go through and take inventory of your life and, and what you're into. Right. If you're into woodworking, there you go. Right. If you're into gardening, there you go. Oh, but Scott, isn't there already a lot of people doing gardening? Yes, but maybe they're not doing it like you right? Or maybe they're not going to do email marketing like you. Maybe they're not going to do SEO like you. Maybe they're not going to be as good of a marketer, right? So there's a ton of opportunity there for us to not just have the best product, but to also be a better marketer. And that's what I would recommend in doing if I was just starting over again, because that's how we've done it. Start with yourself. What is something that you would enjoy working on every single day? day. And Chris, I know that you're going to have a couple of, of uh, words of wisdom here, but what would you say, right, to someone that is struggling right now to find their niche? So but before we dive into that, Scott, is there such thing as a niche that is too competitive in your mind? No, I do not believe there is a market or a niche that is too competitive. And the reason why I say that is because I feel like, and, and again, I'm talking about the Etsy ecosystem right now, right? I'm talking about Etsy in general, like right now, there's not a lot of shop owners that are good marketers. Just saying no, uh, you know, no offense to anyone out there, but there is, there's a huge opportunity for people to be, uh, to out market shops. And I think that's, that's the thing that holds a lot of people back because the, the best way to find a niche is to look at what you are interested in, right? Do something like the touch list exercise where you literally take this and this and just write down everything, including the pen and the notebook that you touch for the next 24, 48, 72 hours. Take a look at your Amazon purchase history, your Etsy purchase history. What are the things you have to do to, today? Scott, you have to take your daughter to beach volleyball. That's a potential niche. Uh, you really like Chipotle. Okay, that's not really a potential niche, but it's something you're going to do, so write it down. Right. Maybe uh, Mexican food would be a potential niche, I guess, but that's neither here nor there. And then we have to run it through two filters. We're going to take that big list and we're going to run it through things you actually care about. Right. Unless you're really into writing things down and you love calligraphy or you love notes or something like that, you're probably going to cross off the pencil and the paper from that list immediately. Once you get through that, and you say, these are the 20 things from this list that I really love. Then we're going to go to Etsy and see what the possibilities are. Some of those things you will find that you'll find a lot of other people who are also interested in that, and you'll validate that through the demand. Some of those things, you may be one of 10 people. And then the question you have to answer is, how much money do I wanna make? And will my niche that I'm most interested in support that goal, right? And if it does, then you just go with that niche. If it doesn't, then you can either say, does it get me close? Or is there something that I can add on to this that is not a different niche, but is a, a shoulder niche to your point, Scott, um, you know, beach volleyball. Okay. Maybe we add in regular volleyball, like indoor volleyball. 
maybe we add in some other beach activities and make it more of a beach sports brand, right? What do we have to add into this that would still make sense for that customer that will get me to my goal? And if you can go through that very basic process, that gets you most of the way there. And the reason I think a lot of people don't do that is because it seems too easy. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it's, it's exactly what we do. So it's like, I can't stress that enough. Like don't fear away, uh, of the competition because you're never going to find a niche that doesn't have a, a good niche. Let me say that a good niche that, uh, that doesn't have a lot of competition, right? I would rather have this massive pie of competition that I know there's money flowing. And all I got to do is just find a way to get in there a little bit. Right. And that's how, kind of how I think about it instead of trying to find these little hidden micro niches. Right. So I want to go bigger. I want to know that I've got potential and I've got room to grow. Right. I've got room to grow. So that's what I would say. If anyone right now is struggling, if that's you, if you're struggling to find a niche, that's where I would start. And then once you do find that niche, then I would go ahead and start building that out, creating your product line, doing email marketing doing your SEO, but then using Etsy ads and then having amazing customer support. And if you do that, now you've built a true brand and you're going to have repeat customers. People are going to be happy because why? Well, because you're the go-to now. You're the go-to for these types of products in this niche. All right. So that was quite a bit there that we just covered. Uh, let's do, let's do another one here, Chris. Chris, we have any quick questions in the, in the chat before we get into another one here? Yeah, you need to I'm, I'm all kinds of laggy over here for some reason. Yeah, uh, you are. we had one quick question about customer service in terms of filter number five or thing number five in the formula. And it's how do you address concerns of a customer? And the answer is as well as possible, right? Like just do the right thing. That's going to get you the, the biggest benefit out of that. If somebody mm -hmm. says that their product came damaged, don't fight them on it. Just send them a new one. It's not worth the fight. It's not worth doing any anything other than just taking care of the customer. And if you think about the businesses that have the worst customer service, uh, I don't know. Everybody could probably say their cable company, right? Or their internet provider, who I'm about to yell at right now. Um, <laughs> it's because they never do the right thing, right? And if you do the right thing for one person, not only do you take care of that customer, not only do you make a customer for life, but they then also go tell everybody else either in the form of a review or they go tell their friends who are also interested in that niche, hey, this guy, this girl, this lady, this group, this family really took care of me. And that starts to spread and brings you in even more business than the the fight over the $5 that you have to spend to send a new t-shirt. Yeah, no, 100%. All right, let's uh, let's go into uh, another one here. This one here, I, I, wanna, I wanna bring this up because this is a big one. I hear people saying, Etsy is a scam and they don't want Etsy sellers to succeed because all they want to do is take your money. And I want to think about this for a second. Like let's, let's sit down together and, and talk about this. All right. Does it really make sense that Etsy would want sellers to fail? I mean, honestly, what good would that do them? They'd be out of business. If anything, they want us to succeed. And the reason why they want us to succeed is because if we do, they make more money, okay? And if they are able to make more money, they want to keep doing what's working for them, which is having sellers create products and sell them. And all they got to do is collect the money, right? The, uh, here, here's another one I get. Uh, Scott, Etsy ads are a scam. They don't work and, and they, they're just taking our money. Again, let's go back to a little common sense here, all right? If that was the case, do you think that, uh, well, people would still be running ads? No, because if they're not working, I'm going to stop running the ads. They don't want that, right? So a lot of times I see people blame the platform on them not either having good products or maybe just not doing good SEO and optimization, or maybe they're running ads and their expectations are not what they should be, right? Because, and here's the, here's the, the problem. 
with uh, people that are just starting. And no offense to anyone that is just starting. And hopefully you've been watching videos on this channel because we talk about all of this stuff. But when you're looking at Etsy ads or any ads for that matter, we shouldn't be looking at, I put a dollar in, I got a dollar back, right? Or $2 back, I should say. You, you want to get the dollar back, $2 back, right? We always want to take the dollar, make a dollar 50, right? Or put the dollar in, make a dollar 75, right? Like who wouldn't want to do that? But this is why we talk about building a brand so much and we want to get a customer. So anybody that's studied or anybody that has run an e-commerce business understands the cost to acquire a customer, right? That is a big deal. Anyone here watch Shark Tank? Anyone? So if you're watching this video right now, drop it in the comments. Are you a Shark Tank uh, watcher? How many times do they say, how much does it cost for you to acquire a customer, right? That's what they're asking. And the reason why they're asking that is because they want to know how much did it cost to get that customer? Because I need to know so I know when I'm going to start making money on that customer. Because usually in the beginning, it's just a break even. So if you think about this, a lot of times people are turning off their ads when they're actually performing pretty well, right? If you put $100 into ads and you made $300 back, you'd be like, okay, but then I had to take out how much the product cost, the shipping, like all of the things, my fees, all that stuff, right? Okay, so you broke even. Or you made $1.10 on your dollar ad spend, right? That's good. But I see a lot of people saying Etsy ads aren't working for me because all they're looking at, and most of the time it's because they're selling one-off products, right? It's like, uh, I'm going to sell that bass fishing t-shirt and then I got nothing else to sell that customer, right? I'm, I'm trying to find a completely different customer over here, right? That's the problem. When I'm spending money on ads and I see that we spent a hundred dollars and we brought in $300. I know that we didn't make profit or a whole bunch of profit. We made some, right? But it's not like I look at it and I go, okay, our margins are 40%. So how much did we play? We broke even. I'm like, that's a good day, right? Because I know those people are people that are buying into our, you know, our brand, which, you know, our brand has a whole bunch of products that are related to a niche, which I preach a lot. Right. And so now I know that that person also is probably going through my autoresponder through Everbee email. And if you're not using Everbee email, I'm going to give you a little, a little plug here for that, or I'm going to give it a little plug because it's really, really powerful. And that is email for shops.com. If you go there, you can sign up and I recommend that you do. Yes, you'll buy me a cup of coffee if you go through my link, but I just promote products that I believe in. And that one there, I believe in. All right. So if you do that, I'll also give you uh, some email templates and some goodies there. If you want to email support at brandcreators.com and I'll give you all the details there on how you can get them after you sign up through that link. But here's the deal. People sign up, all right, or they buy a product and they immediately start going through my autoresponder that's set up already pre-built that I wrote the emails to. This number one, it engages with my customers. It gets my customers to know that I'm a real person and I'm a real business because I did write those emails, by the way. And then they get to say, hey, I loved it so much. I'm going to leave you a review. So now I get a review out of it, right? So all of this stuff happens, okay, because, well, because I was able to run an ad, get a customer, and now I bring them into the ecosystem, right? I bring them into our brand. Now I know. I can sell them more things in the future. If they had a good experience, I could follow up with them through email if they join my email list. So all of these things happen because I ran an ad. Now, I'm not saying ads is the only way, but I know a lot of people, they get stuck there and they're like, I'm not going to run ads. I'm not going to spend any money because Etsy's a scam. Etsy ads are a scam. I'm here to tell you they're not a scam. All right. It's just the way that we are looking about it. And sometimes you have to almost look in yourself, right? And say, okay, I, I need to, I need to look Am is my products or are my products that good? Or is, are my mockups lacking? Are, you know, is, is my, my product design lacking? Like something might be lacking and sometimes the truth hurts and we have to kind of admit that. So maybe you got to zoom out, look down on your business and go, you know, is it really Etsy that sucks? Or is it, is it me? You know, I, I hate to say it, but that's what we have to do. And sometimes 
you know, the truth hurts. I've done it before, you know? I, yeah, I always like to, to say YouTube doesn't like me or Facebook doesn't like me. That's true. But if I'm spending money on ads with them, they, they want me to like them, right? Because they want me to keep spending money. And that's what we have to think about. So if you're thinking Etsy's a scam, I'm here to tell you, I don't believe it is. All right. But again, it's totally your call. Let me know in the comments. Do you think Etsy's a scam? Do you think that they're just trying to take your money and give you nothing back? Leave it in the comments. I'd love to know. But that's what I would recommend. Build a brand. Chris, I went on a little bit of a rant there. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, maybe. It depends on how frozen. Yeah, I, I don't am. know. You're looking a little glitchy over there. We might want to we might want to throttle you down a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I just ran a speed test and it's the same as it always is. So who knows? Uh, is my audio okay? That's the real question. The audio is good. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just rant for everybody who's on here with us live. Just bear with my very slow moving head and I'll try to make as exaggerated faces as humanly possible. Is Etsy a scam? The answer is no. And Scott, to the point you were just making about, you have to think sometimes that it might be you. Well, it might be you. Anytime we say YouTube hates me, Instagram hates me. Facebook hates me. What we're really saying is the algorithm hates me. And what does the algorithm stand for? Well, it depends on the platform. But in the case of Etsy, what the algorithm is after is the product that is most likely to sell to a customer who's searching for whatever it is they're typing into. Yeah, guys, let me know in the comments. Is Chris totally froze or is it just on my end? Let me know in the comments. We might have to uh we might have to have him refresh. And I'm gonna wait a second here, guys, until I see if you guys are if it's me or if it's if it's all of us. And then we can go ahead and get going. Uh, I see frozen, froze, frozen. Okay. Am I, am I coming through? Okay. Am, am I, am I still able to, uh, to communicate? Let me know in the comments. I'm just going to wait here awkwardly. Let me know if you guys can see me moving around. I think you can. Um, cause Chris still looks frozen to me too. So, um, I got a yes. You're okay. All right, cool. I'm going to keep rolling here. And if Chris is maybe in the comments, he can go ahead and uh, and he can uh, answer some stuff in the comments. All right, cool. I'm going to keep going here. I've got a couple other things that I wanted to address. I did want to address one here, a question that came in. It says Facebook user, so I don't know the name. Um, how do I build an email list as a new shop, as a new Etsy shop? Here's what I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to I'm going to say this very quickly because. There is some steps to it. I do have a resource that I can share with you, but basically what you're going to want to do if you have no customers is you're going to want to, you're going to want to build an email list through a giveaway. All right. And again, this is what we've done. I'm just telling you what we've done and it's worked very well. You will have to have some products. If you have three to five different products that you know, your market wants, then what you can do is you can create a little Facebook ad, maybe spend five bucks a day, 10 bucks a day, and then you're going to drive them over to the giveaway. We use King Sumo for the giveaway. And then from there, we're going to build that email list. And then we're going to export that list. We're going to import it into Everbee email. And then we're going to start be, being able to send them emails. If you want to go through a full course on this and anyone else that's watching this, just go to email sign up for Everbee email. You'll get one month free and then send an email to support at brandcreators.com. Again, that's support at brandcreators.com. And then I will send you a full-fledged course showing you exactly how to set everything up from the very beginning and picking your products to, to put in the giveaway to actually delivering it and everything in between. So if you want that, go on over and, um, and sign up over at emailforshops.com. All right, let me answer another one of these here. Uh, okay, this is a good one. A lot of people struggle and, uh, and want to know, uh, what, you know, what the truth is about, about this here. And, uh, and, and another reason is, is it holds people back from actually starting. So what is the truth about collecting email subscribers from Etsy? I heard that it's illegal. 
that it's against their terms of service and you could get shut down for it. And I'm here to tell you that in their documentation, they actually recommend that you collect emails. Now, are people doing black hat stuff? Are they doing stuff that isn't within terms of service? Are they scraping their customers' emails and sending them emails? Yes. Is that against the terms of service? Yes. Will that get you banned? Yes. Don't do that. They have it right in their documentation. If you get a minute, you can go into their integration in that little integration tab inside of your dashboard, and you will see that they have actually connected or integrated with a company called AWeber. Now, I'm not a fan of AWeber. I don't use AWeber anymore. We're using Everbee email now, um, but it goes to show you that they are allowing you to collect email addresses as long as you follow the terms of service. And the terms of service are pretty simple. You should read them, but basically we need to get our customers permission. And inside of Everbee email, the way that it works is there's four emails that go out. Actually, there's three that go out per order, and then you can add another one on to request a review. But inside of these emails, we are asking people to basically subscribe to our VIP list, which is our email list. And it's totally fine to do that because we're letting people know we have this email list. This is what we, this is what we send the people that are on this list. You're on our VIP list. And if you sign up, just click this button, you'll be signed up and then we'll send you emails. You can unsubscribe at any time. Okay. But here's the thing that's really cool that a Weber doesn't allow you to do. Okay. And this is really important. It says in the terms of service that you can send email to your customers about an order. Okay. Let me say that again. You can send an email to your customers if it's about the order. Okay. So imagine someone just purchased from you. Okay. And let's say that you manually reached out to that customer and you said, Hey, I just wanted to let you know, I'm confirming your order. It came through fine. We're going we're gonna to prepare it and I'll let you know when it's shipped. Thanks again. Talk to you later. Oh, P.S. We have a VIP list if you want to join us where you can get special discounts and uh, new releases and you can also get entered in our giveaways that we run every, every few months and you can join the list, right? That's it. That's email number one. It's about the order, but then we can throw that little thing in there because we're actually emailing them about the order. The second email, again, if you use something like Everbee email, this is all automated or you can just do this manually. The second way is, well, the order has been shipped. So you say, Hey, just want to let you know your order shipped today. And, uh, and here's your information. And I uh, just want to let you know that it should be arriving soon. Let us know if you have any issues, let us know how much you, you enjoy it and, uh, talk to you soon. PS. And I would say the same thing. If you haven't joined our VIP list yet and you want to get special discounts, the same thing, basically. And then we ask them to join the newsletter, right? Or the, the email, the VIP list. Okay. That's the second email. It's about the order. Remember that. Okay. Third one. Okay. Your item's been delivered. Hey, just want to let you know, I noticed that your item was delivered. I'm so excited to see what you think. Hopefully everything arrived. Okay. And if not, let me know, because I want to make sure that you're a hundred percent happy. Cause that's what we do here with our small little business. Right. And I always say small business by the way, too, because I want people to know that we're a small business because people like to support small businesses. All right. That's the third email that goes out about the order. Okay. So again, they say Etsy that you can email about the order and that's all we're doing. Okay. And you might also say, well, Scott, yeah, but doesn't Etsy already send these emails? And the answer is yes, they send the emails, but they probably get delivered to the spam folder because they're from Etsy and it's, you know, made up of all of these images and it's, you know, it's a, it's a promo type email when yours aren't. So also is they're getting an email from you, the owner. And now it shows like, oh, this is the owner reaching out to me. This is kind of cool. And we, since we've been doing this, we've been getting some really, really great emails. Like we get probably five to 10 new emails a day coming in from the emails that we've sent that say, thanks so much for reaching out. This is awesome. I'm so happy with my item. I can't wait to, to share it or gift it or whatever. And uh, I'll definitely be back in the future. And oh, by the way, I just left you a review.
Like not kidding. Like that's happening like every day. Okay. Because we have this thing set up. So does Etsy want you to email your customers? Yes, they do. They want you to take care of your customers. That's what they want. They want you to take care of your customers. Do they want you to do email marketing? Yes. But to the people that actually raise their hand to say, yes, you can email me. Okay. Outside of this order. And that's basically it. Okay. Now, again, do your own research, go into their terms of service, read it for yourself. But if you go into the integration and you see what they're saying about email marketing, they want you to do it. And the other thing is they rolled out a program called share and save rewards. If you haven't seen that yet, you should take a look at that because it's pretty cool. We've been using it and it works really well. And this is where they're saying, if you drive traffic to your Etsy shop, we'll actually charge you 4% less of fees, 4%. So out of a hundred bucks, you're going to get basically four bucks. Okay. You just give it to you. All right. Okay. So we started doing this. We sent emails. Okay. To our list. And in 30 days, we were able to make $3,177 from email and we made over a hundred dollars back. Okay. Um, so the, the share and save rewards, it's proof that they want us to send traffic. They want us to use email. All right. So this whole thing about, well, does Etsy really want us to email our customers? Is it against terms of service? You need to know the truth about it. And that's why I wanted to shoot this, this little video here for you is to let you know, like, no, you can do it. You just have to follow their guidelines and they want you to do it. So if you're not using email yet, start using email. Chris, are you back, man? So <clears throat> I think so. I can see you better and you're less fuzzy. You will never guess what was going on. Well, I don't have all day, so make sure that you tell me we, quick. <laughs> we use we use a little piece of software called StreamYard to do this, right? They haven't. Yeah. And you're frozen again. Just when it was getting good, guys, just when it was getting good. All right. I'm going to keep going here because I think you guys can still see me, but Chris seems to still not have that figured out over there. It sounds like he was going to say StreamYard was, uh, was having a problem. Um, all right, cool. Uh, let's go through, let me see if I got any other quick questions here. Thank you guys for hanging out with us too, by the way. Oh, and, uh, if you guys would do me a quick favor, uh, if you guys would either subscribe to the channel, if you haven't done so already, cause we do these live every Wednesday, um, and we have new videos going up all the time. Uh, it also helps the algorithm. And, uh, if you would just drop a comment down below, let us know, like, what is something that is a big takeaway that you, that you got from today's live? That would be awesome. If you do that in the comments, that would be amazing. All right. Let me go ahead and address one more, uh, little concern. Um, or I guess not even a concern, but like a mystery of like what you should do with SEO. All right. So Another big, big thing that I hear from people is SEO and Etsy. Like, what do they really pay attention to? Like, how do I, like, how do I use SEO and make Etsy want to show my products? How can I win with SEO, right? Like, what's the secret? What does Etsy really want? Well, they actually tell you, right? If they And I'll actually link it up in the description here of this video, but they have a guidebook and it literally tells you what they want. Now I've said this before and I'm going to say it again. SEO is just a small portion of you getting visibility by the way, right? Imagine yourself right now competing with just, let's say small 10 other listings. There's probably more than that, but let's just say you're competing against 10 other listings with a similar product trying to sell to the same customer. What is Etsy going to do when they're looking at SEO? They're not just going to look at how well everything is optimized. Yes, they'll look at that. But the one thing that's missing in the SEO formula, and it's not in the handbook, is sales. If you optimize and you do everything they tell you in the guidebook that they have for you, and you get sales, you're going to outrank everyone else because they want to get sales. They want to know the listing that people are buying, right? And if that is the case, they're going to bump you up in the rankings. So let's talk about what is important 
What are the main things that they look for when they are indexing these different listings? Well, number one, and the one of the most, I say one of the most important, because there's a lot of important pieces, but the, the one that is going to tell the algorithm what you sell is in the title. Okay. That's number one. But a lot of people think that's all you need is just a great title. You'll get top of the search. And then if you get on top of the search, you're going to make sales. It's not true. Okay. Because the second piece is your product images and your mock-ups. And I know recently we had this big mock-up scare, this drama. Everyone was saying, oh, the mock-ups that we're using are getting us shut down. And we did a whole live stream here. And I'll actually link that up in the description as well if you want to see and hear what we discovered and what the legal team actually reached out to us and told us what they were concerned with. And really, in a nutshell, is they want your product images to be, get this, of your product. And you might say, well, how do I do that if I'm, if I don't have the product physically, I'm doing print on demand. I, I don't have the products that I can show people. How do I do that? It's very simple. You use a third party mock-up, but here's the big, but it needs to be of the product. It can't be an AI generated uh, t-shirt that kind of looks like your t-shirt, right? That's the problem. All right. You have to show the product that you're selling. So one little tip here for you, if you are using third-party mock-ups, which we are, okay, is you want to reach out to the people that are creating the mock-ups and you want to ask them, are you buying the product and then photographing the product? Or are you buying this from a third party and then you're offering it? Like, are you the middleman? And we want to know that because if someone is doing that, they might not own the rights to that mock-up that they're selling you. So I want to know that I'm going to the mock-up store and I want to know that I'm going to the one that is actually creating the photograph or the image. Okay. Really, really important. And the thing that I see here is when you're looking at the image, when someone looks at an image, that's going to represent the product. That's going to represent the feel of your brand, the feel of your shop. All right. So if you have a crappy image, it's going to represent a crappy brand and a crappy maybe buyer's experience, right? So when we're talking about SEO, the image doesn't necessarily get you found. The title does, right? But the image gets the click. And when we get the click, then the next question in the algorithm is, does it get a sale? So that's your conversion rate, okay? If it gets a sale, that's good because now the algorithm is going to go, all right, someone searched for this, they clicked on this listing and they purchased from this listing. Huh, let's bump them up in the ranking, okay? So those are the two pieces. The third is your description. Now your description is just going to be another place that yes, you can get picked up for keywords, but you wanna just describe the product. You wanna, you wanna show people and tell people what they're going to be receiving, some important things that you know that your customer is going to be wanting to know or their questions they're going to ask. You want those all kind of right in that description. And you also want it easy to read. I see a lot of people just creating this, this massive, long, giant text block. You want to break it up. People like to scan, right? So that's the other thing is your description. That's another conversion piece. That's another one we just talked about. Someone clicks into your listing. That's the first part of this, right? Get found with the title. Someone searches for something, they get, you get the click, they come into your listing and now they're in the listing. And now that description is going to help convert them to a buyer. All right. So that's that. And then tags, are tags even necessary? Do they even use tags? Well, yes, they do. And we have proof of it because it says in the handbook, it says that, but it also says it when you're advertising and you are running ads, it will give you suggestions. It'll say, Hey, we found some extra tags that you're not utilizing. Would you like to use these? Why would they do that if they weren't using tags, right? So that tells us clearly they are using tags. So we want to spend a little bit of time and we want to, we want to put some good effort into finding good tags. We use Everbee to do this because Everbee will show us our competition, what they're using. And what we'll do a lot of times is we'll take maybe five uh, different uh, listings maybe and we might see, okay, what ones are we missing? What ones didn't we think of, right? And we'll get some ideas and sometimes we'll use them and sometimes we won't. Um, but yes, the, the, uh, 
the tags are important. All right. And then the other piece that really doesn't get talked about, and I don't know if it's a huge conversion piece, but is your star seller. Uh, little badge, right? So this you get if you've done all of the things that Etsy wants you to do in order to make the customer happy. Was it shipped on time, right? Um, have you been communicating within a 24 hour period? Like things like that. That's what they're looking at. That's what's going to give you that badge. Does that help you sell more? Maybe a small percentage, but it still probably does. So why not aim for that, right? So Etsy SEO it's not really that big of a mystery to me anyway. And the reason why I wanted to do this video was to share with you that you really just need to focus on the basics of the optimization. Now I say basics, the image, that's a big one. And I see a lot of people with crappy images. It's going to, it's going to result in crappy results because you're not going to get the click. If we don't get the click, there's no chance for someone buying your stuff. That's so really, really important. And then the other pieces that I see a lot of people missing especially new sellers is they're just waiting for the algorithm to find them. They're waiting for them to rank them and give them traffic. And a lot of times that's not going to happen depending on your niche that you're in, depending on how competitive it is. You need to start running some Etsy ads to start driving some sales. So this way here, when we get those sales, now we've just signaled to the algorithm again, people are buying from this listing and that's going to help us rank in the search of Etsy. All right. So that is everything that we follow. We don't go any deeper than that. We don't try to do any trickery, any hacks or anything like that. We just basically follow those principles and it's been working very, very well for us. We get a lot of organic search now and we do get a lot of traffic from paid and we get a lot of traffic from our email list, which is something that we really, really emphasize because once again, Etsy wants us to drive traffic. So we might as well give Etsy what they want, right? And they'll reward us with more traffic and hopefully more sales. All right. So Chris, are you there yet? Or are you still frozen like Frozone from uh, Incredibles? It, ooh, Samuel Jackson. I'll take that. Uh, so StreamYard Scott is turning on and off the beauty filter. Oh, you do need Repeatedly. a beauty filter, by the way. I know. Uh, <laughs> so that appears to be the issue. It's using eight gigabytes of my RAM. Oh, wow. That's cool. Every time it turns it on, which is why the video was slowing down, but the audio was okay. Yeah. I think the you feature. look better without the beauty filter. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> you somebody in the comments said, I'm more interested in your knowledge and wisdom than how good you look. And I said, that's good because otherwise we'd all be in trouble. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Cool. Uh, all right. Um, th this was good. Th this was a good session other than you being frozen for the day. Um, but uh, woman, where's my super suit? Love that scene. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right. So let's go ahead and wrap this baby up, put a little bow on it, hopefully get you guys on with your day, but also get you guys uh, really ready to take 2024 by storm. Like I really want you guys to succeed. That's why we dedicated this, this whole live stream to really talking about building a brand and some of the things that get people hung up. Let me know in the comments though, if this is something that helped you. And if it is, smash the like button because that helps the algorithm on YouTube as well. We'd like that. Uh, and then just subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Maybe even share this with someone. If you're listening to this on the podcast and you can't do any of that other stuff, well, we love you too. And if you would just head on over to iTunes and leave us a review over there and let us know what you took away from today's episode, that would be amazing. So see, you guys can still show a little love. All right, so that is going to wrap this up. If you want to try Everbe email, definitely, definitely go through our link because we will give you a bunch of different bonuses that are going to help you actually build your list and convert more of those customers into subscribers and into more sales. Head on over to emailforshops.com and you can get that bundle by signing up there, but then you'll have to send us an email to support at brandcreators.com. Again, that's support at brandcreators.com. And then we will send you over a nice little bundle of email marketing materials. All right. So guys, that's it. That's going to wrap it up. As always, take care, take action, have an awesome, amazing day. We'll see you right back here on the next episode. Take care, guys.